Work, energy, and power. Let's go back and review work and effort. Remember that when you were just holding on to a box here, even though you, you're putting out an effort, you were not doing any work because you didn't move it through a distance. Remember, to do work, you needed to apply a force through a distance by lifting a box in this particular example. So work is the average force times distance. Now you're doing work and putting out an effort. But there's a lot of different ways to do work and we could distribute the work differently so that the effort can actually be less and still do the same amount of work. I mean, really not the effort. The force could be less. Uh, the work that you're doing can be distributed over a greater distance. For example, we have uh, a job to do, and that is to raise a bowling ball 0.8 meters. Well, if I lift a bowling ball straight up 0.8 meters, I have to apply a force of 60 newtons. So the work that I would do would be 60 times 0.8, or 48 joules of work. Now, if I wanted to raise that bowling ball the same, to the same level, to the same height, I, would, uh, I could use a ramp here and slide it up this ramp. And when I slid it up the ramp, I could slide it up the ramp, and this is a, a frictionless ramp. If I, I could slide this up the ramp using a force of 40 newtons, and, but I'd have, to, I'd have to slide it for 1.2 meters. So I'm using less force over a greater distance, but 40 times 1.2 is still 48 joules, and I've given the bowling ball 48 joules of potential energy. If I wanted to make my job even uh, easier in, in, in the sense that I'm applying less force even, I could do it even over a more gradual ramp. So applying 20 newtons over 2.4 meters also is 48 joules. And we did the same amount of work, but we distributed the force differently. That's why climbing a ladder is more difficult, uh, requires more force than going up a steep set of, set of stairs. And that requires more force than walking up a gradual ramp. And yet you still get to the same height, you get to the same level, and you've done the same amount of work. There are several different uh, ways we can uh, decrease the force uh, and still do the same amount of work. For example, we could use levers where we push down on a, on a rod here that's on a fulcrum. We have to push a great distance to barely raise the rock here, but we are able to lift the rock where we wouldn't be able to lift the rock um, any other way. So we are decreasing our force by increasing the distance traveled uh, making it uh, a greater force here for a smaller distance traveled here. This idea of distributing forces differently um, and distances differently is called mechanical advantage. This car weighs considerably more than I weigh, but with a long enough lever, we can lift the car using only my body weight. Simple machines have been used for thousands of years. In fact, they were used to build the pyramids and Stonehenge. We still use simple machines to help us do work. We find hinges, gears, and four bar linkages in all sorts of products. And we continue to build on the basic principles, combining these objects to create increasingly complicated machines that are better at doing specific tasks. Pulleys are another example of a mechanism used for mechanical advantage. For example, in all four of these systems, we're lifting this weight of 100 newtons, 10 centimeters, everywhere along here. Notice that uh, when I just have a single pull and I pull down, there's no mechanical advantage. I pull the rope the same length and lift it 10, I lift it 10 centimeters here to lift this 10 centimeters, and I apply the same force of 100 newtons to lift 100 newton weight. However, if I use a double pulley system, now I have to pull this rope 20 centimeters in order to lift this weight just 10 centimeters. And therefore, uh, I gain mechanical advantage and I only have to lift with a force of 50 newtons to lift the weight of 100 newtons. I'm doing the same work though, because remember work is force times distance. And so 
50 newtons times 20 centimeters is the same amount as 100 newtons, 10 centimeters of work. So our third and fourth systems, to show uh, when I go to a three pulley system, I have to pull three times as long with one third the force to lift it. And with a four pulley system, I have to pull four times the length to lift it just 10 centimeters with one fourth the force. But nevertheless, it allows, allows us with limited strength to lift things we wouldn't otherwise be able to lift. And of course, the work we're doing is changing the energy in the system. There are other systems as well, such as gears. And gears on a bike, for example, when you change gear on a bike, it might be easier to pedal, but you have to pedal more to move the same distance. So gears also give us mechanical advantage. So let's go back and do a little review here, first of all. Work, we know, is the average force times the distance. And we know that work causes a change in energy in the system. And we've seen different ways that uh, work can create potential energy. For example, when you do work to stretch a slingshot, you are creating elastic potential energy. And uh, now the position and arrangement will cause this when you let go to do something. And you can also raise a rock up to a high level by doing work and create gravitational potential energy. And then there are other forms of potential energy too. Uh, nature does work to uh, create and build the cells that uh, create wood and that stores uh, energy and position arrangement of the molecules in the wood and uh, so that gives us potential energy too. Now work can go directly into kinetic energy. You don't have to go to potential energy first. Work can go directly into kinetic energy. For example, when you drive your feet around to pedal a bike, it's going into the translational kinetic energy of the bike. The bike moves. When you throw a ball, the work that you do of providing a force through a distance of the throw ball translates into giving that ball motion or kinetic energy. And finally, the gas that burns inside of your pistons in your engine drive the pistons down and goes right into the rotation of uh, the system and kinetic energy directly. So far we've been talking an awful lot about gravitational potential energy and everything that we've done where U equals mgh. Uh, in this case the mass is the mass of the rock and the h is the height of the cliff. But there are other forms of potential energy as well. We've used the slingshot example a couple of times. It has a little bit different formula and you don't need to memorize this formula but this is what we call elastic potential energy and x right here is how far you've stretched and k is a property of the elasticity of the band in this case. So there's also elastic potential energy and we'll get to later units where we talk about electromagnetic energy and really chemical energy is a form of electromagnetic energy uh, but we usually analyze it through uh, chemical uh, means and finally there's also nuclear uh, potential energy and depending on how you break things down you can also conceive of different uh, forms of potential energy uh, most of them though end up being electromagnetic in nature There are also three types of kinetic energy. We've mainly been talking about what we call translational kinetic energy, where objects are moving in, along a path. And uh, that translational kinetic energy is the one we've learned the formula for, one-half mv squared. So that's the energy because the object's translating or moving uh, in a path. Then there's also the possibility of an object rotating, revolving around a fixed point. So when we throw a baseball, for example, it doesn't just translate, it also is rotating and spinning as it goes. So rotational kinetic energy is uh, given a little bit different formula based on what's called its rotational inertia and its angular speed. We don't have to memorize this formula or use this formula, but there is a formula for it. When, everything, when something's rotating. You know that you wouldn't want to go up and touch a spinning tire, for example, because it does have kinetic energy. And finally, we can't see it, 
But uh, we know it's there because of its warmth and so forth, or how cold it is, rather, uh, both, both cases. There's this idea of thermal or uh, kinetic energy, which is due to the molecular motion of the particles that make up the object. So if we could zoom way in, we might be able to see the atoms and molecules bouncing around, uh, vibrating, rather, inside of a baseball that gives it its temperature, and that would be its thermal kinetic energy. Again, it's related to the temperature of the particular object. So there are three types of kinetic energy. I just mentioned thermal kinetic energy, um, and that is different than a concept called heat that we'll deal with a little in a little more deal, uh, detail later. But heat is the transfer of thermal kinetic energy through either convection, conduction, or radiation. This will be a, a future topic, but heat is not energy. It is the transfer of energy. And on to our last uh, defining element in this video, and that is the concept of power. We've uh, talked about energy and work. Power is an important concept because it tells us the rate of doing work. And that's what power is, how much work you can do in a certain amount of time. So the more work you do in less time, the more powerful you are. Power is measured in watts after James Watt, who improved the steam engine dramatically and therefore provided uh, power uh, for the industrial, industrial revolution. So James Watt is credited uh, for his work by um, giving him the unit for power. That's why you've seen uh, on light bulbs 40 watts and so forth, because light bulbs are, are rated based on the amount of power uh, they deliver in luminescence. So, doing more work in the same amount of time means that uh, you're delivering more power. So, power. Let's see how we calculate power. We're going to take this system where we have our weightlifter driving the weights up with a big force of 1,800 newtons. That's about 405 pounds. And this weightlifter, when they apply this constant force of 1,800 newtons, lifts the weights 0.5 meters. And it takes him about one and a half seconds to lift this weight up to here. So the amount of work he did was 1,800 newtons. That's the average or constant force times a distance of 0.5 meters. So he did 900 joules of work. And he did that work in one and a half seconds. So now we can calculate power, because power is how much work you do in a certain amount of time. So in this case, 900 joules divided by 1.5 seconds is 600 watts. And that's a lot of power. Um, in fact, that's about how much power the lighting in our classroom uses. So, uh, wow, you'd have to have this weightlifter lifting all day long to power the lights in our classroom. We should really appreciate how much power we really do use regularly. So, um, lighting uses an awful lot of, of power. Another way to look at power is through delivering energy. For example, power is how much work you do in a certain amount of time. And because work causes a change in energy, and work and energy are equivalent, another way to look at power is power is the rate of delivering energy. Power is how much energy is delivered in a certain amount of time. Uh, and if we rearrange the equation by multiplying both sides by T and flipping it around, we can also see that energy is equal to power times time. In fact, Energy is what's delivered by our power company, and uh, so our power company charges us in kilowatt hours. Power in kilowatts, thousands of watts, uh, times hours. That's a big amount of energy, a kilowatt hour. And so let's take a look right here on this power meter, and when we blow it up here, we can see that kilowatt hours is the uh, quantity that your power company charges you for. So energy is power multiplied 
by time. And Scratch's parting thought. And good luck on your quest for continuous improvement.